Brad Gilmore, but you might know me by another name. You might know me as... Oh, oh my God, you're my dreamboat, for sure. You're a slacker, Brad. Oh, Brad, what have you done now? And he joins me now, one of six men to play the iconic role of James Bond 007 with over 65 acting credits to his name. The living legend himself, Mr. George Lazenby, joins us on the program. Mr. Lazenby, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing okay. You know, apart from the virus is bothering me, just the fact that it's out there. Yeah. I- um, it, it changed you know, my life. I don't travel much anymore. And... Uh, but other than that, you know, things were good. Well, it's great to hear, sir. I mean, obviously, that it's changed everybody's life uh, in, in many different ways. Um, but we're glad that you're safe. I'm glad that I'm safe. We're able to have this conversation today about what I think your, your journey, your story, your life is is really one of a kind. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you today about it. You I mean, everybody knows your name. Everybody's seen your face uh, at one point or another. But I wanted to start with... Um, this, you, you obviously grew up in Australia, uh, lived in Australia for, for quite some time. Uh, talk to me about kind of beginning out there. Were you, were you well off in Australia? Were you from a working family? No, I was from a working family. I never had a bank account. So we were a pretty poor family. And, uh, I fell in love with, um, Jack Fingleton's daughter. Jack Fingleton was captain of the Australian cricket team. And his best friend was the Prime Minister, Bob Menzies. <laughs> and I uh, fell in love with his daughter. And I uh, went up there one day to take her out. She only go out with me during the day after I asked her about seven times. And uh, her brother attacked me and put a headlock on me on the lawn. And his mother came out and saved me from that. And then I went into the house. And there was Bob Menzies, the Prime Minister, sitting on the couch talking to uh, Belinda's father, Jack Fingleton, the cricket captain. And I said, Jesus, mate, you look like uh, Bob Menzies. <laughs> I'd never been that close to the Prime Minister. <laughs> and uh, and she was walking across the room, and she put her, head, <laughs> her hand over her eyes. <laughs> and she walked across. Anyway, we got along. And her boyfriend was down in Sydney doing these exams. And uh, we started going out together, and then the father didn't like the idea of me being with her because I was a motor mechanic and then a car salesman. And, uh, you know, he expected her to do better than that, so he sent her over to England to work with uh, Lord Snowden. And I was, uh, you know, getting like five letters a day at first, and then all of a sudden they thinned out to one a week. So I knew she'd met somebody, and uh, I got on a boat, and it took me six weeks to get to London, <laughs> and I couldn't find her because she wasn't at the address where she was when she was writing to me, and there was no internet or cell phones or anything to, to do any deep looking. But anyway, one day I was in the overseas visitors club, and a guy came in and said, oh, I just saw a uh, down in the road with a bunch of cricketers. So I went down there, and uh, my heart was beating. And next thing I know, uh, she's right in the middle of all these cricketers. And I said, uh, "Can you come outside? I want to talk to you." I said, "No, whatever you've got to say to me, say to me here." I said, "No, I want to talk to you outside." And then this guy must have been the one that she was with. Poked his head, and you heard what she said. And my fist came up automatically and decked me. <laughs> Didn't even think. And so I picked her up and took her outside, put her in the car, it was right hand drive. And she hops out and all these cricketers are coming out of the pub. And I took off. But then uh I knew where she was because of the cricket team. They were the Oxford cricket team. And so I uh wrote her a letter and and she said, Well, my boyfriend's busy doing his exams <laughs> uh, we can see each other platonically and strangely enough no one me or anyone I worked with knew what platonic meant <laughs> <laughs> I was taking around all the sales and everything what's platonic mean fuck it if I know and then uh, so I just said wrote back yes 
And um, she said, we can see England platonically. And I said, okay. And I went and saw the guy who delivers the cars. And I said, where's the furthest car you got? And he said, Bristol on the other side of England. I said, I'll deliver it for you for free. So I called her up. I said, have you seen Bristol? She said, no. Let's do it. So we went over to Bristol and uh, I snatched the key off the office at the desk of her room as well as mine. And uh, I went to go to a room that night and I had diarrhea, which I'd never had before. (laughs) And every time I went to go in the hall, I had to go back to the toilet. (laughs) And so I gave up after about six tries. And then uh, I think English food got to me. And next morning at breakfast, uh, she told me that she couldn't believe I didn't try to get into her room. <laughs> and funny she knew. But anyway, uh, on the way back to London, uh, uh, the guy traded Mark 10 Jagger, which has a big front seat. I thought, geez, I've come all the way from Australia. I might as well. I went underneath the freeway and grabbed hold of her. She cried the whole way through. And then uh, she was leaning against the door, and then she came at me, and I kind of put my hand up to duck her. She said, I love you. <laughs> so she moved in with me, and that's why I stayed in England. And uh, I'd never met an actor, by the way, when I got the Bond job. I had not not met an actor. I'd met male models, but that was it. And uh, I told them that I'd worked in Manchuria and Russia and places I didn't think they could check on. And because uh, back, back then, you know, people didn't have the internet or or IMDb. No, they didn't. Yeah, no. just search you up real quick, so you could have made up however many films. And and when you say you told them, was this Cubby Broccoli you were talking to? Yeah, Cubby and Harry. Cubby and Harry Saltzman, okay. And they were the yeah, producers of uh, mm-hmm. What's that? They were the producers of, of the James Bond films back in the yes, day. Yes, yeah. they were the original. Mm-hmm. Uh, Harry Saltzman wanted to buy the rights, but he didn't have the money. And they brought Cubby Broccoli in, who had the money. And that's how they got together. So, and uh, I was... Uh, then uh, they found out... Uh, they brought the director back from Switzerland to meet me. I was so impressed with my physical because I didn't say much. I had an Australian accent. And uh, next thing I knew, uh, the director comes in from Switzerland to London to see me. And he said, tell me what you've done. And I don't know what made me do it, but I, I said, I've never acted in front of a camera in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and he got up and started laughing, walking around the room. Saying, they brought me back from Switzerland to see you. God, stick to your story. I'll take you over. Let's go over and uh, stick to your story that you originally told them, and we'll go over and see them. So we went over to the road, and they were outside their office door. They said, get him out of here. He's a closed peg. <laughs> they called me a little closed peg. So I, uh, I was just about to go up and thump him before I left, and uh and Peter said, I want to test him. You're not testing him at the studio. We're the laughing stock of the industry. And they've tested 800 guys already. And uh, and Peter said, well, I'll test him at your place. He said, do you want to? Because they had to be nice to the director. Because Peter was, uh, you know, with the Bond people ever since they started. And uh, But he hadn't directed one yet. He had edited them and done things like that. But meanwhile, uh, yeah, okay. So they got a crew and they started testing me at Peter's place and they were sending me to a voice coach who was uh, coming out when I went in with Harold Wilson, the uh, British Prime Minister. He's having voice lessons because half of England couldn't understand him. He had this (laughs) middle of England accent. And... uh, so I said, geez, who's that? She said, be quiet. She was a real cranky voice teacher. And uh, just lay down on the floor, and she laid me on the floor and put a foot in my stomach and said, now breathe. You've got to fill up your stomach with air. And then she started to get rid of my accent. And then uh, they 
I had to change my walk because I used to walk like cowboy from side to side. And uh, you had you can't do that in cinemascope. So they changed my walk, they changed my talk, and finally the United Artists, who were the distributors of the Bond film, wanted to see me do a fight scene. And Harry, I remember him saying, he's Australian, all Australians can fight. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, we want to see him. So they got about eight stuntmen and lined them up. And they're all going to come at me one at a time, and I'm supposed to, you know, duck their punches and whatever. Well, the first guy, I'd only been in real fights in my life, so I hit him right in the chin and he went down. His name was Yuri Geller. He was a Russian wrestler. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, you better kill me. And then Harry Salzman pushed me up against the wall. And he said, we're going with you. Tell anybody and the deal's off. And get out of town. And, we'll, and then call me and let me know where you are, and I'll call you to come back for the press conference. Okay, so I went back to Paris, where I'd been living. And uh, I was with six of my mates. I had been away four months. And they said, where the hell have you been? We've been looking for you. And uh, I said, I was in London. Doing what? Testing for a film. What film? Bond film. They said, did you get it? And I said, yeah. And they all laughed. They didn't believe me. <laughs> I was lucky. <laughs> and, and then uh, I went off to the south of France and I called Linda and uh, and she came to, I got I got her a ticket and uh, she was on her way down when they called me, get your ass back to London. We're doing the press conference tonight. Oh dear. And so I met Belinda at the airport. <laughs> I told her I'd come back. I couldn't come back. I got so busy after that. But I... Uh, I went uh, to the press conference and they proved on me, obviously. And uh, then um, we started uh, rehearsing and shooting for well, nine months. Never heard of a film taking that long this year. But um, we're six months in Switzerland and I got sick of being up on this mountain after about three weeks. And I said to Harry, I said, I, I don't want to be up on this mountain anymore. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I, I have it. I've been to every restaurant up there six times. And I, I've been with every girl on the film. <laughs> 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 and I, I've done it all. And he said, well, how about if we lend you a helicopter at night and you can go into Missouri or Geneva or wherever you want? I said, fine, we'll do that for a while. So they loaned me a helicopter at night, and um, I didn't fly it, of course. As the pilot did hand me the wheel at one stage, and it was going sideways. <laughs> he grabbed it back. But I then had a clue how to fly a helicopter. But meanwhile, um, we we did our six months up there, and then we went to Portugal. did six weeks in Portugal, and a couple of weeks at Pinewood Studios. A silly thing happened. The uh, Cougar, Ford Cougar people gave me a Cougar, brand new, but left it at Pinewood. And Richard Harris had a uh, big Rolls Royce, you know, the big limousine one. And uh, the only way well, they wanted us to pay taxes on. And I said, no, I, I don't want to pay taxes on. The taxes will cost as much as the car costs. And uh, I said, well, it's all going to exist. You've got to pay the taxes. I said, what do you mean as long as it exists? He said, well, some people just burn them. The cars. So Richard and I put parked our cars in the middle of uh, a lot at Pinewood and they set them on fire. Why, 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 <laughs> mine, why, mine had about 10 miles on it. <laughs> why would people burn them? What was the purpose of that? Just to not pay they taxes? don't exist. They oh. don't exist. There's no tax. <laughs> well, I guess that's one no way tax. to do it. Yeah, well, that's what they told me to do. <laughs> pay, pay the tax or burn it. And uh, so that ended up there. And uh, then they loaned me a past part. But then uh, Triumph and uh, Norton gave me a motorcycle. So I used to uh, ride the motorcycle to work. And then they had to get me off those. So they uh, they lent me an Aston Martin, 
if I don't ride the motorcycle because of insurance. So, yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on during that film. But then at the end of the day, I ran into this guy, Rowan O'Reilly. He launched all the uh, English pop groups, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, you know, you name them. And he had Radio Caroline. He had this boat in the middle of the harbor. So it was in international waters. And they, he could play music from there. And the English only had one hour of pop music on a Sunday night or Saturday night on the, on the BBC. That was all the pop music the English were getting at the time. And Roman started this radio tower and with these Beatles and groups that were fantastic. And uh, he got really wealthy doing that and very, uh, it's just, uh, he was very important in that business. And he came up to me and uh, said I, who he was and he'd like to manage me. And I said, uh, well, I'm, I'm the contract to the bond people. He said, no, you're not. You've signed a letter of intent to sign the contract, but you've not seen the contract. So, because they were still making up the contract. And uh, a letter of intent to someone who's not been an actor before and not knowing what's in the contract, would win the case. So I believed him and I wouldn't sign the contract. And they put a million dollars in cash on the table thinking that that's anything I ever seen. And it was hard to walk away from, but I did. And uh, and a million dollars in those days, of course, was $5,000. So you imagine how much a million was. And then... Uh, I said, where am I going to work? I can't work in England. He said, you go to Europe. There's a guy that Clint Eastwood doing West. And uh, he's making 250 grand a movie. So I believed him. And uh, I went off to Europe. Every movie I got on, Salsa and Broadway would call up and uh, tell them I'm under contract to them. And they won't be able to release a movie. Oh, no. So I was getting thrown off every movie. And I finally went broke. I think I didn't get the million, and I and he had the money that I saved up from the bond film. That was ten thousand dollars or something. They get like fifty million now. I got ten grand, and then uh, I I heard that the English were getting kicked out of Malta, and there's a lot of cheap boats down there. And this guy, he was. When uh, prime became prime minister, and told him to get out. A lot of them were just trying to sell their boats rather than sail them all back to England. So I went down there and I got this boat that was worth probably 20 or 30 grand for a catamaran. It was a catamaran, 34 foot catamaran. It was, uh, I'd never sailed in my life. He gave me one lesson in the harbor. The guy I bought off from Scotland. And then he left town. And the next day, I sailed a mortar. And fortunately, I had prevailing wind. I still remember the 56 degrees on the, on the compass. <laughs> I assume it went right down the harbor. Then I didn't know how to stop it. I was turned, uh, turning it around and around. The sails were going everywhere. This guy came out and helped me. But I got caught in a storm later on. You know, life was pretty exciting. I had a girl with me who I ended up marrying because she got pregnant. And uh, her brother told me that she's got to be a boy of the fortune. But the kid won't get uh, any of the money unless uh, he's born in marriage. So that's why we got married. And that was my first wife. And... Uh, and the girl's name's Melanie. She's the number one realtor in New York. So, uh, you know, it's like everything I've done in life, I uh, didn't have any training for. You know, I knew more about cars than most mechanics did when I was 15. Because my uncle used to put me on his knee from about three years old. And I'd go to a garage just after school and watch the mechanics work and I thought that was going to be my life until uh, they needed a, a sales manager. 
And the fact that I was a mechanic, I could drive the car and tell them what it needs fixing and how much it's going to cost. And that was the most valuable guy in a, in a dealership, was it a used car sales manager. So I got that job. And then, uh, oh, that's right, I was at a, uh, a dance. And this guy was in front of me going up the stairs, and he kicked back at me. And I grabbed him by the leg and pulled him down, and the guy behind me said, you'll want my size. And I whacked him, and he went down the stairs backwards. And it was a cop. He pulled out his badge. Oh, no. And so they took me into uh, Canberra jail. Didn't charge me anything, just locked me up. And uh, came in, three of them came in with their sticks and just touched me on the stomach. And I pretended it hurt, and it didn't hurt. It didn't leave a mark. But eventually you get nausea, and that hurts. And uh, they let me go the next day, no charges. But when I went back to the dance, nobody had danced with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the guy, it's a policeman. You know, so I went up to the band and uh, said, I want to be in your band. And they said, what do you play? I said, nothing, what do you need? And they looked at each other and they like, I'm nuts. Well, we don't need anything, we're fine. As, you, as I was going out the door, electric basses had just come in. And uh, they, one of them said, you know, too bad you have to play electric bass. And I overheard it. And uh, I went to the guitar shop because they didn't have electric bass in Australia at the time. And they taught me how to play bass on guitar. And then I got an electrician to make a bass amp. And I went back to them about six weeks later. I said, I can play the bass now. And they said, oh, here's this nutcase again. And... Uh, showed him I could play in any key. I just moved up and down the fretboard. And uh, they said, okay, we can use you. And the, they wanted the amp more than me. And uh, the guitar player really loved the amp. And so uh, I started playing in the band. And they cut a long story short. I played for about six months. And then I broke away from them, took uh, a couple of the guys with me, and started my own band. And that's when I... Uh, I had plenty of money then. I, I uh, met Belinda Earn. It was uh, started meeting different people. And, and, and then and I while told you were them, at the car, went, excuse me, I'm sorry, but why were you while yeah. you were at the uh, uh, dealing the cars and you were the used car dealer? Is that when uh, a talent agent saw you and, and said you should be a male model? Was that around the same time? That was no. That was in Australia. I'm talking about this is when I got to London. Oh, this is when you had got to London. This, okay. Yeah, the, this happened in London. I was uh, selling uh, used cars out in Finchley. And then this guy who I used to drink with at the overseas business club, I used to steal his women off me all the time. I didn't know he didn't like me. I said, you know, you, we used to drink deal. He said, George, I'm leaving the uh, Mercedes Benz. He was a Mercedes Benz dealer at Park Lane. Go in and play, apply for my job on Monday. But don't go before. I said, okay, Errol. Errol Forbes was his name. And uh, I went in there and I, I said, I'm, I'm here looking. I want to get Errol Forbes' job. And they said, oh, would you mind waiting in the office there? Errol had sold a bunch of cars and kept the money and ran off to Europe. And I didn't know that. And the next thing I got five cops in the office with me. And they're... Uh, asking me all about Errol, they're calling Australia, backing up my stories. And, <laughs> and finally they realized I was innocent. And the sales manager said, yeah, you can have his job after the cops left. And uh, the sales manager was a drunk. He'd go to the pub at lunchtime and not come back. So I was running the place. And... Uh, Oh, I had, it was in Park Lane, one of the main streets in London. And uh, one day Elizabeth Taylor came in, started to look at her cars. And uh, she hardly spoke, but uh, she said, I'm just looking. And then uh, Richard Burton came in and said, She's not going to buy a car. I'm going to buy her arm and <laughs> dragged her out. <laughs> so I was uh, living in a Dorchester hotel, which is a few doors down. And. Uh, it was a exciting place to work. 
But then this photographer came in. And he said, uh, I'll buy this car if you let me take pictures of it. And I thought he was gay. So I sent Belinda along. And then the next day he comes back and he says, no, you fool, I want you. They're looking for rugged guys because the models are all pretty boys before me, before uh, this time. And now they're going for rugged guys. So take these pictures down to uh, this agency. After he took them, he gave me a bunch. Of, and I, Scotty's agency on Bond Street. I went down there and I waited my whole lunch out for him to see me. They didn't see me, so I walked out. And uh, there was a guy doing pictures with Richard Avedon, one of the best photographers in the world. And he was holding his babies up while I was photographing him with all these different sweaters. And the babies were peeing on him. And he said, I can't do this, and walked off the job. And... Uh, so Abaddon came up to the agency with my pictures all over the floor looking for another model because he had to go back to New York that night. And he said, get me this guy. And they didn't know who it was. But the photographer had his uh, stamp on the back of him. And they rang him and they got me. They said, when can you get there? And I said, about 5 o'clock. He said, no, that's no good. you got to get there now. I said, okay, and I went there, and I was holding these babies. I'll pee on me, but <laughs> I put up with it. <laughs> and uh, the next thing I know, about three months later, these pictures come out, and everybody wants to know who worked with the best photographer in the world. And I was booked night and day from uh, that day on until I uh, – you know, run out. You know, I had to go to Paris to work because I'd done every ad in London, and uh, I was working in Germany too because they uh, banned uh, model agencies in Germany because a lot of them turned into all all houses. So they banned them all together. So anyone that looked German, which I apparently did, they'd rent you from Paris or London or whatever to go to Germany to do the photographs. So that was my life, and. Um, Having an Australian accent, I didn't do any commercials on it where I spoke. I did commercials where I was just walking around with a big box, a big fry comes into town, and all that sort of stuff. But um, I hadn't spoken in front of a camera. And I went back to London one day to see uh, a friend of mine who wanted to be a, an actor. And he said, you got to help me out. I said, why? He said, I've got a date with the biggest agent in London, and my girlfriend's come back into town tonight, so I can't go. I don't want to leave her standing on the corner. I said, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do it. And her name was Maggie Abbott with CMA. It was called then. I think it's ICM now. And uh, she was waiting on the corner of Bond Street, another street. And I said, I'm Ken's friend, and uh, he couldn't come, and so I've come to help you out. Well, we better go because uh, I was going to take him to a movie, a screening room, where she was. And we would go to the screening room and the Beatles, the Stones, you name them, all in there. That's how we saw movies. And I didn't see the movie. I just stared at all these famous people. And then, uh, and this is hard to believe. But um, Maggie, I took Maggie home. I didn't see her again. I went back to Paris. But the night that uh, I was with these friends in Paris, not uh, not the night that they, I told them I did the Bond thing, but I was with these same people. This is before Bond. I uh, picked up this girl, and uh, I went home with her, and the phone was ringing. You know, they had phone lines those days. They didn't have cell phones. And I... Uh, she said, it's put two. I said, how could that be? He knows I'm with you. And it was Maggie Abbott. She rang my flatmate, and he said, I went to this restaurant. She rang the restaurant, the maitre d', told her I went out with this girl. She found her number and called me. Now, you'd think I'd think that was important. She said, you've got to get back to London. I think you're right for a role that they're having trouble finding someone for. Ah, I said, okay. 
and I forgot about it. And about a month later, I went back to London and I saw my friend, what did Maggie want you for? I was going, oh, yeah, 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 she called me at this girl's place. I said, call her back. Let's go see her, because he wanted to be a um, actor. So I we went to see her. She waited, waited outside. She said, and then she said, uh, I, I said, well, why, why do you think I, I'd make a good uh, actor? She said, well, you've got what they're looking for. I said, what's that? She said, arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> Said, you're so sure of yourself. And so uh, she said, I, I said, what's the role? She said, James Bond. I couldn't believe it. Wow. And she gave me uh, the address to go see him after she called up. And uh, I told I told you, I told all this bullshit story about working in places I thought they couldn't check on. But is it true that you you went and got the same suit that Sean Connery wore in the film? Yes, and I cut did. Your hair? I did. I got it by a fluke because there was one he didn't like, and he left it there. My arms were about an inch longer than his, so all we had to do was put the sleeves down an inch, and uh, and I wore that in there. That's how. I, I wanted to look, and I got oh, got my hair cut where he got his hair cut. It was right down the road from uh, Mercedes Benz. Kurt the barber. <laughs> and apparently Kurt from Broccoli was in there. After I got the job, Kurt told me, he said, you know what, I was cutting uh, Cubby Broccoli's hair after I'd finished yours, and you were getting your coat on and leaving. And Cubby said to me, that guy would make a good James Bond. <laughs> and Cubby didn't remember that it was me or anything. I had to remind him. But uh, it was, that's how it all happened. I mean, it's an incredible story. And, um, and, and, and here's the thing, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, the film that you were in, uh, nowadays is regarded as a top five Bond film. And if you look at some websites, they have it listed number one or number two. It's either on Her Majesty's Secret Service or Goldfinger. How do you feel about that after all these years? People really have now grown an affinity and fondness for, for the movie. Well, you know, my ego says so they should have. But <laughs> the other part of me, I'm amazed because, you know, Sean Connery, knew more about acting than I ever would. And uh, Roger Moore was up for it when I was up for it. Uh, he was uh, waving to me, putting his uh, arm around his face and hit his face when he saw me. His, uh, and uh, all the other guys, I, I just uh, did the best I could. I knew, you know, a little bit about acting, but I went, uh, to Charles Conrad the acting school for 20 years after I did the Bond film. And he was the best teacher in the world. He uh, used to put any he and she on the script, so you never had any idea who wrote or what it was about or the character. But we got to the point where we could pick up the writer's vibe. And uh, it took me about three or four years before I could do that. I was in his B class three or four years and one day he gave me a script for a girl and I started reading it and behaving like one he said now you can go into my A class <laughs> oh wow so and you took yeah. acting lessons after landing at that time the biggest role in all of Hollywood uh, you do on Her Majesty's Secret Service and then you go on to continue acting L let me ask you though so there's this long kind of I don't know rumor or people just assume that you aren't asked back to the Bond franchise but you actually turned it down correct yeah. Was, and, and, and that was when you talked about the million dollars and, and, and all that stuff. You turned it down, but then went on to still, you're acting to this day. Um, was there anything from the Bond experience um, that you look at now with all the knowledge that you've gained throughout the years and the 20 years of acting classes? Do you look at your performance now and say, man, if I could have gone back and, and had I known now what I'd know, I could have played this role differently? Or are you satisfied with how the film came out? No, I'm satisfied. Um, I, I wasn't near half the actor I am now, but I could, um, you know, I'm not looking for work, by the way, guys. 
I'm uh, I'm not the sort of guy that wants to get up at seven in the morning and read lines at night and go to work. But unless the part was sensational, you know, where you could really get out there. But on the other hand, uh, I uh, you know I was quite pleased with my performance. There was nothing. You know, uh, I, I'm, I wasn't intimidated by cameras because I'd been a model for years. And uh, I wasn't afraid to uh, stand in front of a camera, if you know what I mean. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the thing that mo- some actors have the hardest time with, especially going from stage to screen, which I know you were a model before, but when they get on the screen, that camera changes their whole dynamic and their eye line. Yeah, well, it didn't change me. Right, <laughs> right. yeah, I mean, you I were just, used uh, to it. I just did my thing. <laughs> the, um, looking, though, back at it, uh, again, On Her Majesty's Secret Service is, is widely regarded as, as one of the best Bond movies of the 25 that they've done, and um, this last one that came out, No Time to Die, pays several allusions and tributes to that film, um, which I'm sure you've heard yeah. by now. Um, and, yeah, I saw it. Did you like it? Uh, parts of it. Parts of it, yeah. It was, uh, you know, it didn't seem to have any rhythm. It was a little on the you long know, the side. Huh? It was a little long, right? It, it felt yeah, a little long. Yeah, a long shot. The car chases were unbelievable. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, um, that's just my opinion. You know, some people I've met, well, I loved it, but it's, um, it's one of those things, you know, you just, uh, I wouldn't have done it like that. Right. And, it's, and uh, it's all I think they, on. yeah, I think, you know, they had the girl in the love scene and he gets killed at the end. But that's um, a different story. Right. Right. Now, when you, though, um, obviously people know you from James Bond, but again, I said you have 65 acting credits to your name just on IMDb alone. Uh, what is your, well, looking at your career now, what has been the role that you've enjoyed the most? Is it James Bond or is it something else that you've played? No, it was James Bond. You know, now they had the budget, the time, the, the, everybody was an expert at what they did. And uh, it was, uh, you know, when I look back on life, it was my best experience. My first one. <laughs> right, right out of the gate. Um, th- and that's yeah. why I've always found your story so incredible is your first movie was the biggest movie in production at the time. I mean, there was nothing bigger than On Her Majesty's Secret. No, I, it took nine months to shoot. Yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible. that the And the film is so damn good. Like, it's such a great made Bond film. And Here's the thing. I think everybody you can like or a Bond film, even if it's not very good. But your film is excellent, and it's really an upper echelon uh, of the Bond movies themselves. I know you said that was your favorite role um, out of your career, but you're still acting to this day, correct? Yeah, sometimes. I do a bit acting. And uh, it's not uh, it's not hard for me now. I mean, I've you know, I spent 20 years in an acting club, and, it, uh, and I loved it. That's why I did it, because he told us nothing about the role we're playing, and it just gets him, her on the script. And uh, you go for it, and somehow or other, you change your personality and everything. It was just, you, you come out the other side wondering, gee, how did I do that? And um, that's what acting is all about. Being able to not be yourself, right, right, and, and and to find a way to channel that, like you've done uh, throughout your career, it's really impressive, uh, Mr. Lazenby. I've already gone over on the time that we agreed upon. You can find uh, George Lazenby on all social media: Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at George Lazenby Official, website George Lazenby Official. Dot com. Sir, it's been an honor and a privilege to talk to you today, and um, your legacy will be forever remembered, and your bond will always be regarded as one of the best of all time. I uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. All right, Mr. George Lazenby, thank you so much. Oh, Brian, what have you done now? now?